Secondhand emotion. What's love got to do with it? It's a catchy song. We are in the third and final week of our What's Love Got to Do With It series. So Tina will be getting to you in just a moment. Just want to remind you a couple of announcements you just heard. Starting point class tonight, 6 o'clock, right here. If you are new to this congregation, this is a great opportunity for you to come, learn more about the church, ask some questions, get to meet myself or Pastor Dave will be here tonight. So go ahead and join us tonight for that, 6 o'clock, right here. And then next week, meet and greet dinner. Uh, we haven't had one in a while through the winter and I think we've only had one since, since the pandemic started, but just an opportunity to come together and meet and greet some people. Yeah, very good. Uh, meet and greet. Connect. So whether you're new, or whether you've been here for some time, let's, let's connect. Sometimes it's real easy to miss people in and out on a Sunday. So next week, meet and greet. Tonight, 6 o'clock starting point. We are in What's Love Got to Do With It? We started talking about dating and relationships and purity. We turned our focus last week to marriage. This morning, we are talking about raising godly kids, uh, raising godly children in a very ungodly world. Uh, you know, I was thinking about this because there's a lot going on, obviously, in the news this week on the topic of uh, kind of just went through my head thinking about godly kids. Uh, Everything going on in Ukraine, right? Um, unless you're under a rock, you are, you are aware of what this is all about. We got to get Tina Turner's face off that. That's going to kill me. That's just a lot of Tina. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, watching the news this week, my daughter, my oldest, was born in 1998. In 1991, Ukraine came out from under the Soviet Union and kind of became its own its own nation. There's 30-year-olds who every single day of their life, they have lived under the threat of Russia coming to invade. Teach your kids to be, to be thankful that they were born in the greatest country in the history of the earth. 30 years old, and all they've ever known was the insecurity and the fear of a neighboring country coming in to invade. And that was their daily, their daily reality. We forget how blessed we are sometimes. We forget how good we have it. Uh, obviously, pray. Pray for the situation there. Pray for our leaders. Pray for the leaders of the nation. Our, need, our, our leaders need Prayer, hello? Church, that's what we're called to do. Pray. For every complaint, give two or three good prayers and lift them up and pray that God would use them and give them wisdom, leaders of the, the world, people of Ukraine. All right, let's jump. Romans chapter 12, verse 2 has kind of been our, our launching point for this entire series, tells us simply this, do not be conformed to the pattern of this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Now, when we related this to dating, we set the standard high because we wanted to do things God's way, not after the pattern of this world. This world's pattern when it comes to dating is awful. So when we move ahead, we talked about marriage last week, and marriages in the world are 50-50. They're a coin flip. We want to do it God's way. We, we want our relationships to glorify him. So that's what we talked about last week. And again, this verse holds true when it comes to raising our children. 
we are not doing this the world's way. We are going for God's way. Some ways of the world here, how we, how we discipline our kids, the world will tell us how to do that. How to educate our children. There are many differences between what the world will educate your children about and what the word of God tells us to educate our children about. But I think perhaps the, the single greatest lie that's been told regarding our children is this idea that kids don't need two parents, specifically a father. Uh, you don't have to, to, to be a rocket scientist to figure out that, that fatherhood is, is under attack. Fatherhood is ugly. Uh, TV dads. Think of some TV dads. They're absolute train wrecks. Whether they're animated <laughs> or whether they're actors. The, the image of a father is someone who's clueless, racist, out of touch, just completely useless. But the truth is, two parents are important. And, and just to go on a little, a little tangent, fatherhood is important. Uh, in 2015 to 2019, the share of families headed by a single parent was 75% in the African-American community, 59% among Hispanics, 38% among whites. That's awful. Overall, it's close to, to 50, 51% kids being raised in a single-parent home. Now, we're not just talking golf season when the dad's not around a lot. That's different. Give us some grace. Single-parent households are our problem, and it's impacting our children, and overwhelmingly, it's the father who's missing. This morning, as we talk about raising godly kids, we have to address the single parents, the single moms, single dads, because they have the same job with half the firepower. That's a lot of work. They need our prayers, and they need our support. If we're a church family, we need to rally together. But it doesn't change the fact fathers are important. Listen to these statistics about fatherhood. And dads, maybe this is just an encouragement for you to, to step up and remember why, why you do what you do. 63% of youth suicides have occurred in, from fatherless homes. 90% of all homeless and runaways were in fatherless homes. 85% of all children that exhibit behavioral disorders were from fatherless homes. These are huge statistics. And the world will tell you, well, it doesn't matter. You don't need a mom and a dad. Just a mom can do it. Or two moms can do it. Or two dad. I don't know. The world's confused. But fatherhood is really important. 71% of all high school dropouts from a fatherless home. 70% of juveniles in state-operated institutions from fatherless homes. 75% of adolescents in substance abuse centers, not all the ones who are, the ones who are in, in treatment for it, 75% from fatherless homes. So let's end that narrative that it doesn't matter and that fatherhood's not important. Dad, you got a big role to play in the life of your kid. This morning as we go through this, whether you are a dad, a mom, a single mom, a single dad, this is how God's word tells us to do probably the most important job you'll ever have. And I think that job is raising our children. My little quote the last couple of weeks, God creates, Satan corrupts, man confuses. When, when it comes to parenting, when it comes to raising our children, for, for so many, our kids are, are in school seven, eight hours a day and to be honest, you're just happy they're out of the house. And for seven to eight hours, sometimes we don't even know what they're learning. And it's not just what they're learning in the classroom, what they're learning from their friends and what they're learning from the other people to influence it. There's a lot. Mom and dad, we have a big role to play. Now, I know there were several men and women who were thrust into single parenting against their will. They're making the best of a tough situation. And it will be more difficult as a single parent, but the job is the same. The task is the same. How do we raise godly children? So I got three tips for you, three things for you kind of to consider when it comes to raising godly children. And the first one that I will start with is this. 
what is the goal of parenting? Now, I'll fast forward because I've said this every week. So if you've been here, you know, there's no spoiler. The goal is obviously to glorify God. Because in your dating, you want to glorify God. In your marriage, you want to glorify God. Raising kids, you want to glorify God. In your whole life, our goal is to glorify God. So let's get that out of the way. Let's get a little more specific. What is the goal of parenting for the follower of Jesus? Now, I'm making the assumption this morning that I'm talking to followers of Christ. There will be tips that I give you today that will help you even if you're not a follower of Jesus. They will benefit your children. But my understanding is we're talking to the church today, and we're talking to those who are followers of Jesus. So I heard an interesting study where they did an interview with mothers from China and mothers from America. And maybe you've heard this before, you've seen the study, but they asked American moms, what is the one thing that you want most for your child? And the number one response among American mothers was we want our child to be happy. That is not a bad goal. The same survey in China yielded a different number one answer. The number one answer among Chinese mothers was we want our child to be successful. Happy, successful. Let me be very clear. We are fans of both happy kids and successful kids. But the goal as a follower of Jesus is not merely happy and not merely successful. The number one goal for parents who are honoring God, the most important thing is that your child will be a lover of Jesus, that your child will be a Christ follower. This is the most important thing, and it's hard for me when Christian parents, I don't know if they forget this or they just don't know how to emphasize it, because this this is something I thought about like before my kids were born, before we made the choice to have children, this is something that went through my head. I don't want to bring a child into this world who's not going to serve Jesus. Hell has enough people. I don't want to contribute. As a parent, this was a weight. As a pastor, this was, this was a weight. The most important thing, always, that my kids would have faith. And there's some things, now listen, this is the bottom line. We can't guarantee that, but there's things we can do to make it more likely. Last week, we had the 100% guarantee, right? Last week, the 100% marriage fix guarantee works every time. I don't have one for you today. This one, we have to just do everything right as best as we can, even though we're flawed, even though we'll make mistakes, and we have to trust God with the rest. But there's certainly some some things we can do, some attitudes to take, some approaches, because the most important thing for a follower of Jesus is that their child would have faith. I don't understand how some people don't get this. I don't know how this is not the most important thing for every Christian parent. School, that's important. It's not this important. Having good friends, also important, not this important. Sports, I love sports. Sports get a bad rap in church. Sports are not the problem, but they're not the most important thing. Success, college, good job, all of those are okay. All of those are things that we want for our kids, but the most important thing has to be their faith, that we lay the foundation for our children so that they have every opportunity to follow Jesus. If the number one goal was success, what would we do? What would the steps that a a parent would take if the most important thing was that your child would be successful? Now, I've already said that's, that's good. That's not the most important thing. And it's the world's definition of success. There's going to be some very worldly successful people who spend eternity separated from God. In the eyes of God, that's not a success. You could have money and goals and and hit all your your checkboxes and not be a success in the kingdom. 
the most important thing. And, and parents, we know this. I'm not saying anything a Christian parent hasn't thought. The most important thing is that our kids have faith. But if the goal was to be successful, what steps would we take to help motivate in that direction? Again, we can't make it happen, but we can guide and we can steer. Well, we would want our child to train. We would invest time in them. We would get them the best teachers or coaches. We would help instill disciplines in them. We would make sure they're practicing their piano an hour a day. Is it an hour or is it more? I don't know. Lori, help me. Uh, whatever it is, we would make sure you're shooting your foul shots, 100 foul shots every day. That's what we did when we were on the basketball team. 100 foul shots, and that's how you got better at shooting foul shots, unless you're Shaq, and then you're just never good. Didn't matter. It would be more than just some goal, some daydream. Oh, we want you to be successful, yeah, and then not do anything. There would be concrete things that you would implement to help the child get there. How is it any different when it comes to raising our children for the Lord? It's the same thing. The topic is different, but it's the same. How many times have you asked your kid, did you finish your homework? A bunch, right? How many times have you asked your kid, have you read your Bible today? How many times have you asked your child, have you prayed today? Yeah. Be homework's important. Kids don't like to do it. It would be called home fun if they like to do it. It's not. It's home work. And we check on that. We want to make sure. In fact... Some of you good parents, check the work. Make sure they actually did it because they figured out the answers are in the back of the textbook. You can just flip and, oh, I got them all right. Do the homework. Kids will be like, are they really in the back of the book? I need to go check that. They used to be, but it was like 100 years ago when I was in high school. So do we do, we do the same thing for our kids do we do the same thing? How many times have you read your Bible? Are, are you, are you in, the, in prayer? What's God speaking to you? What did you learn at youth group this week? We, it's the same thing. In any area that we want our child to do well in, we, the parent, mom, I don't care if it's school, I don't care if it's sports, or if it's church and faith, if you don't get involved, if you leave it just to them, they have a, a much harder time achieving the goal. Parents, we are called to train, to raise up our children. It's not just we throw them out there and be like, good luck praying for you. No. We, we train. We teach. We instill godly values. Sports often get a bad rap when it comes to church. Church kids and sports. I want you to I love sports. Anybody who knows me knows I'm a sports nut. Sports are not the problem. Priorities are the problem. You get to see clips from Christian athletes. Only the, the famous ones, obviously. Like the Christian athlete at the local community college. That's awesome, but we don't usually hear about him. But we hear about Christian athletes. Some quite... Prominently, uh, over the last several years, kind of out of date now, but Tim Tebow never had a problem excelling at sports and keeping his faith first. Sports are not the problem. Priorities are the problem. And when we put something else before faith and before, really before their eternity, then it's our priorities that are messed up. Listen, I believe we can have happy, successful children who are deeply and passionately in love with Jesus. This is not one or the other. And, and see, that's the problem. We get into this binary thinking. Well, it's either Jesus or it's you can, you can go and, and, and excel at school or go to college and have a good job. Stop it. Stop with this thinking that it's one or the other. We could be on fire for Jesus with all of our heart and you can still excel at sports or school or both. It, it's not one or the other. It's priorities. 
Mom and dad, your job is to instill the proper priorities in your children. Your job as a parent is to make sure that they understand the most important thing. It's not how well they could kick a ball, but how to live for and how to love Jesus. Parents, the goal of parenting, make raising your children to be godly, make that your number one priority. The most important thing you can pass on to the next generation. Grandparents, you got to say, you, yeah, you got to say you're still an influence. The most important thing we can do is raise our children to be godly. And, and here's the truth, and we know this. There is a cost, there is a very real cost to bad priorities, right? Right? There is a very real cost in the family for the health, especially for the faith of a child when the priorities are bad. There's a price to pay. So parents, we must remember the number one goal, the goal of Christian parenting teaching our children to be godly. All right, let's move on to tip number two. Tip number two, some of your favorites. Let's talk about discipline a little bit. Discipline. Now, I'm not talking about beating your kids, and we have to have that disclaimer every time we use the word discipline. Not talking about beating your kids. That never works, and we need to, in our heads, separate abuse and beating from from discipline. Now, I'm a fan of strategic spanking, It's rare, but powerful and effective when the child is young. Uh, That's okay. I didn't have to spank my kids too often. I think the first time was pretty pretty good. It sent the right message. There was I could count on one hand the number of times I probably spanked both of them combined. Now your kids, I want to spank them all the time, (laughs) but I can't because there's laws against that. So that's different. Uh, But disciplining your children is good. Disciplining your children, absolutely. To discipline is to correct inappropriate behavior. That is the goal, to correct inappropriate behavior. Discipline is not, and this is when it crosses the line, discipline is not the byproduct of the parent's anger about the inappropriate behavior. See, that's very different. My my daughter's done something, I'm I'm upset that she did it. Yes, it could hurt her, but it just made me angry that she didn't listen. And if you're disciplining your child because you're angry with what they've done, you've missed the point. Discipline is I want to correct that behavior, not for my anger, for for your profit, for your growth, for you to learn. Discipline helps train a child. We don't discipline because of how I feel. We discipline because of what they did. And those are different things. James chapter 1, verse 20. Here's a little, a little just golden nugget for you. And I wish I found this verse, found it, like I'd never read it before. I, I wish it s- stood out to me as much as it did like 30 years ago. Simply says this, the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. That is a great parenting verse. Dads, tuck that one in. No matter how mad you get, it does not produce the righteousness of God. That means we might have to change our approach. Might have to change the way that that we do things. Powerful verse. Now listen, let let me go on a little sidetrack here. Because I know that there's single parents and, and you have another, another level of, of responsibility. There's also blended families. That's families where one biological parent and the other's not. And discipline in a blended family is tricky. The mo- just I'm not in a blended family, but I've, I've pastored for a long time. I've talked with a lot of you. The, the most important thing, the most important thing to discipline your child well in a blended family, mom and dad, you have to be on the same 
page. 110%. 110%. If you're the step mom, the step dad, you already, you're already fighting an uphill battle in some regard, you need to be on the same page when it comes to discipline. So my two cents on that. So let's look at God's word and what it tells us about the nature and the importance of discipline. I like what Hebrews 12 shares. Hebrews 12 talks about the Lord's discipline towards us and the reason that the Lord disciplines us, that God disciplines those that he loves. God disciplines us because he loves us. So discipline is not punishment because I'm angry. Discipline is an outgrowth of love. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 11 says this. I think all the young people here today would agree. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Amen, young people? <laughs> it's never fun. If you are disciplining your kids and they enjoy it, you're doing it wrong. <laughs> if you're like, go to your room, and in the room they have like an Xbox, a TV, a laptop, Netflix, Hulu, Amazon, I want to go to their room. That's not punishment. <laughs> no punishment. No discipline. Seems pleasant at the time, but painful. And I love how the verse ends. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. When we discipline our children, the goals are to help bring about change. It's, it's, it's the long game. We're disciplining them when they're young so that we can produce productive, God-loving adults. No discipline is pleasant. We see from Hebrews that discipline is essential. It's a normal part of life. It's a normal part of raising children. We see also it's not pleasant. No one enjoys it. Listen, kids, I want you to hear this because you're not going to believe me, but it's true. We don't like to discipline you. We would much rather you just get it right. I know you think we enjoy it. I know you think when you go to bed, we sit up at night and we're like, let's think of ways to make our kid really suffer. We don't do that. We hate it as much as you do, maybe more. But discipline, it's not pleasant, but it's important. It's important to train, train them up. And it says later, later it produces a harvest. That means it's not always sooner. See, moms and dads, this is where we sometimes blow it. We think that if we discipline them now, it will fix the problem immediately. That would be great, but that's not always the case. Mom, dad, we're, we're in this for the long haul. We're playing the long game with our kids. Yes, we want to bring correction. Yes, we want to bring discipline. But it might not fix tomorrow. But the long haul, the long game. When, when we're consistent. And consistency, so important. Being on the same page, so important. Setting a standard. Keeping the standard, so important. But discipline. Parents, anything that you are not correcting, you are approving. I think I've said this before. If you do not correct it, you approve it. If your son's curfew is 11 and he comes home at 12 and you don't address it next time, it'll be one. It, whatever you don't correct, you're de facto saying, well, it's not a big deal. If they talk back to their mother, and you don't say anything, you're letting them know that's okay. <laughs> there was a story when I was little. I just thought of this talking back to my mother. It may come as a surprise to you, but I've had somewhat of a sharp tongue my whole life. Wow, jeez. Thanks, family. It was bad when I was little. And we were at the dinner table once, and I was sitting between my mother and father. My brother was across the table. My sister's to the left. Whole family at the table together. Mom made dinner. I'm the pickiest eater in the world. I'm sure I didn't like it. Something related to the meal, my mouth started running. I was probably seven, eight, or nine. 
And as soon as the words came out, all I felt was a, a slap to my head. It was quick. It was a surgical strike. <laughs> In and out, no trace of any evidence. Just like, oh my goodness. And I remember, I remember later that night, I was talking with my brother and we were playing. And I was like, I can't believe mom slapped me. And he goes, dude, that was dad. <laughs> True story. Whatever you don't correct, you approve. So parents, we, we don't like this. I know this. This is not something we enjoy. This is not one of the joys of parenting. Like, oh, baby's first tooth and baby's first steps and baby's first spanking. <laughs> no, it's not on the list. But it's such an important part of our role as parents to raise godly children. Too often, parents choose peace over discipline. That is a false peace. Kids need parents to be parents, not their besties, not their best friends. Parents. Parents need to be parents. They need to instruct and lead and guide and discipline and train. Proverbs 22.6, train up a child in the way he should go. We know that. We like that. That's a good part of the verse. Then we skip the next phrase. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. We like to think, train up a child in the way he should go, and he will not depart from it. That's not what it says. Mom, dad, again, we are playing the long game. Your job is to train them up in the way that they should go. So even if they wander, when they are old, they will not depart from it. Train them up. Raise them in the faith. Do everything in your power to guide, to instruct, and yes, even discipline your children. But I think I saved the, the most important tip for last. When it comes to raising godly children, this is really where the rubber meets the road. It's not just what you say, it's what you do. My third little tip for you is the power of a godly example. The most important thing relating to you and your children, it, it's not something you do. It's who you are. It's something that you are. It's someone that you are. The most powerful thing you can do for your child is to set a godly example. Moms and dads, this is tough. Kids hear what we say, but they live what we do. And they're smarter. They're smarter than we give them credit for. They're picking up on everything. They're picking up on how we treat one another. They're picking up on our relationship with God. They're picking up how we live at church compared to how we live at home. And they start putting those things together real early. The power of a godly example is critical. Parents, if we want to raise godly kids, you need to live a godly life. If you want faith to be the most important thing to them, they need to see it as the most important important thing to you. You've heard this quote before if you've been at Bethel, if going to church is optional for you, it will be non-existent to your children. Because as we grow, things don't get better. Sometimes they get worse. If, if you treat being in God's house and church and growth, if you treat that with a very relaxed attitude, your kid's attitude will be even more relaxed. Set the example. 1 Timothy 4.12 is a powerful verse. If you're familiar with the context, Timothy is young and he's pastoring a church. And Paul is encouraging him on how to live. 
and the encouragement that he shares, there's a big overlap and a good encouragement for parents as well. This is 1 Timothy 4.12. Don't let anyone look down on you because you are young. You can skip that part if you're old. Second part. But set an example. Paul was telling this to Timothy as a pastor. I'm telling this to you today as a parent, as a mom or a dad. But set an example for your children in your speech, in your conduct, in your love, in your faith, in your purity. How you talk, set the example. How you live, set the example. How you treat people, how you treat people in your faith, your purity, your conduct, your behavior. We set the example for our kids. We set the example with our words by speaking words of encouragement. We are told to encourage our children not to set them off, not to trigger them, but to build them up. Encourage your kids. Speak words of love. Use your kind words. Talks about how you love. How you love is how you treat people. I heard it said that the best thing you can do for your children is to love your spouse. If you're a dad here today, the best thing you can do for your kids is love their mother. Show them that. Show the, show the daughter what it means to, to love a godly woman. Sh show your son what it looks like, how to treat a woman with respect. Most important thing we can do in your faith, setting the example in your faith, get caught. See, we're going to get caught as parents. We want to get caught doing the right stuff. Chances are they're going to catch us doing some bad stuff too. Let's just be honest. Let's get caught doing the right stuff. Let's get caught reading the word of God. Let them see it in us. Let them catch us praying for them. Let them catch us treating others well, forgiving people, taking the high road, living on the high road. This is how we set the example. This is how we set the example for our children. The godly example that we set, how we live, it's the most important thing that we can give a child because they're looking at you. Now, I understand as we're in here today, and I have the worship team come as we get ready to close. We'll close with a final song and a word of prayer. I understand today there's some of you here today, you're not parents, but you're still an example because there's young people watching you. Even if it's just at church, there's people watching you. Maybe your kids are older. You're like, Pastor, thanks, needed this 40 years ago. <laughs> Sorry. I, I had nothing good to say 40 years ago. It would have just been the ramblings of a nine-year-old. I'd have sided with your kids. But maybe you have grandkids. Maybe there's someone else who you can, you can speak some life and encouragement to. But we're setting the example in our faith all the time. There's some older believers. Scripture talks about this. It talks about the older men and the older woman setting the example for the younger believers. This is true in the faith as much as it is with our kids. Living a godly example, a powerful example. Because at the end of the day, what matters the most is what they see in us. And whether it be a new believer or whether it's your child, your son or daughter, a younger person in the faith or your own offspring, they are looking at you. They are looking at you to see how you live and how you incorporate this thing called faith. They'll hear a bunch of sermons from me from Pastor Naylene, from Brett at youth group. They'll hear a bunch of sermons and they might remember one or two. But they'll remember you, Mom. They'll remember you, Dad. They'll remember how you love them. They'll remember how you treated your spouse. They'll remember your faith. The example that we set 
is critical. You know, God is working through a generation of imperfect parents to help raise a godly generation of children. Mom and dad, I'm gonna let out our secret. A lot of times we don't know what we're doing. We didn't get a handbook, how to raise child number two. It's different, kids are different. Things that worked with one don't work with the other. You have two kids, they both belong to you, they both look like you, they act nothing like each other. How is that even possible? Yet they both act like you. It's crazy. <laughs> there's, no, there's no handbook, there's no textbook. We have the Bible. We have God's word as our guide. But this is hard. We make mistakes. There are some times in parenting you might have to apologize to your child. We are not perfect at this. Sometimes our emotions get the best of us. This is called being human. Set the example and let's do the best that we can to glorify God. And we need his strength if we're gonna do this. If we're gonna raise our children to be godly in a world that from the moment they're old enough to, to go out into it, to a world that is undercutting our very belief system, we need God's help. God, help us to get it right. Help us to live and love and serve God in such a way that our, our children would look to us and say, I want that. I want what you have. The way you live your faith should be so attractive. The kids want to follow in your step. Boy, the power of a good, godly example. As we close this morning, this whole series has been on, on love, loving others, loving our spouse, loving our kids. And the greatest example we have of this is God's love for us. The selfless, the self-sacrificing, the unconditional love that God has for us. And not only does it set a, a very high bar for us, but more than that, it's for us. There's parents here who have messed up. I've messed up. There's grace and love for you from a heavenly father who knows we don't always get it right. There's parents who are in situations they did not want to be in. There's grace. There's hope for you. There's a God in heaven who loves you. And from this point forward, he wants you to get it right. And we have baggage and we have history and we have things in the past we're not proud of, things that didn't go the way we want. Maybe we're, we're past this age and, and we feel guilt and whatever. We need to remember, not only are we to set the example and, and do all this for our kids, we also receive that love of God for us. Mom and dad, you have the toughest job in the world. It gets harder every day. But I love what Ephesians tells us, and I use this verse all the time. It says that he has given us everything we need for life and godliness. So I want you to know today, even when it's tough, even when the situation's not perfect, even when you've screwed up in the past a few times, the grace of God and the love of God is more than enough for us to start getting it right. And that needs to be our commitment. As men of God, as women of God, as parents, God, help us to get it right. Help us to do it well. Help us to be the best example that we can be of you. Bow your heads together with me. Let's have a word of prayer. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word today and all across the sanctuary. Lord, those watching online. Lord, just a room full of imperfect parents. But God, I pray that our goal would be united and keeping you first, making you the priority in our children's lives. Lord, that that would be the most important thing to us. And Lord, that you would help us as we raise them and train them and discipline them. And Lord, most of all, I pray that we 
would set that godly example for our children. Holy Spirit, I pray that your power would just fill moms and dads this morning. Lord, when they feel they've they've run out of strength, that their tank has run empty, God, I pray that you would fill. Lord, I pray that there would be healing. Lord, I pray that the condemnation, the mom guilt, every attack of the enemy to, to undermine us, God, that those things would just be thrown out and that your love and your joy and your peace and the power of your Holy Spirit would instill us, God, to keep going, to keep moving, to do what you have called us to do. Lord, thank you. Thank you that you love us. Thank you that as our Father, you discipline us, you're patient with us, and you love us unconditionally. Lord, help us. Help us to love like that. Walk with us every step of the way. We need your power. We need your strength. We ask these things in your perfect, holy name. Amen. Amen. Church, let's stand together. Let's spend a few moments worshiping the Lord today. If you need prayer, I invite you to come down to this altar. The altar is open. Let's spend a few moments responding to God as we close the service.
spoken this morning, God, challenging us to raise godly children. God, I pray that this message would replay over and over in our hearts and minds as we go about our day, as we go about our week, Father, that you would help us to be godly examples. God, that you would show us how to seek your kingdom first, how to make you the top priority so that our children would see an example to strive after. God, help us to be who you've called us to be. Let us become more and more like you each and every day as we, as we dig into your word, as we meditate on your scriptures. God, as we spend time in your presence, lead us and guide us by your Holy Spirit. Thank you for all that you do. Pray that you bless us as we go. In Jesus' name, amen. See you guys next week.